horrible. You said it. But the effects were decent. Hey, welcome back to Screen Crush, I'm Ryan Airy, and let's talk about the live action Avatar series on Netflix. Now we all agree, the original series is a masterpiece. Today, destiny is our friend. I know it. But we've been burned with live action adaptations before. So, are you the Avatar Ong? So where does this series fall? Was it great or really bad or is it somewhere in between? Now I'm gonna be joined by the Screen Crush crew to get their thoughts, but first I wanna give you my take. And I wanna start with what was pretty great about this season. First of all, and I cannot stress this enough, I do not expect an adaptation to loyally reproduce every single frame of the original series. You're taking like 22 minute episodes and putting them into a 50 minute episode series. So of course they have to pick and choose what to adapt and what to combine and change and throw away. In fact, I prefer that. I like what an adaptation changes the source material enough to keep it fresh while, you know, keeping what works. Like, I'm not so sure that the Avatar live action kept what worked, but I want to stay positive up top before we get into the really negative stuff later on. And believe me, we have notes. Yeah, like everything was wrong and out of order and in every sentence was just exposition. And why is this show just so depressing? Like, 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 person... Who is this show for? Oh, and by the way, I thought you guys would like this new Bison As Jaws parody shirt for sale now at our merch store, ScreenCrushMerch.com, where we design all the merch ourselves. We also have this, I lost my honor at the Fire Nation, and all I got was this lousy scar shirt, and the Uncle Sam, I want you for the Fire Nation Army parody shirt. Now, that first episode starts off pretty great. Like, remember, this is not how the animated series starts. The live action show chooses to give us Aang's backstory up front to give us a visual spectacle that shows the brutality of the Fire Nation and establishes the stakes of this series. And it's heartbreaking. Every part of this prologue is just gut-wrenching. I mean, we watched people get burned. Yeah, and then the Fire Lord went and Anakin to a bunch of kids. <laughs> Right, and it's also important to show the glory of the Air Kingdom so early in the story, so we have an idea of what Aang has lost. I mean, in the show, we typically just see the ruins of the Air Temple, and it overshadows that Aang is a child of genocide. And the prologue also established every kind of bending and gave us an idea of what each bender would be capable of in the future. This did a great job of summarizing the world with action and setting the stakes for the entire series. Hey, are you guys hiring right now? Oh, no, no, no not really. really. It's no, kind of quiet. So. You know, it's after we the holidays. There's not really going on. Like and stuff. Not, not. Besides, I already thought you had a job like dressing up as a dinosaur. Oh, I have seven jobs and I still can't pay my bills and afford to keep my kids all stitched up. Well then, dude, you have to start a real career, like be a back-end web developer. Oh, I don't know anything about computers except for my RPG games. I love my games. Actually, that's perfect because you can learn how to do back-end web development with Boot.dev. They're the sponsor of this video. You see, Boot.dev is built like a captivating RPG game, but to win, you have to learn how to code. You learn back-end web development from start to finish in the Python and Go programming languages. I mean, look, the trick to learning anything is to make sure that you're never bored, which is why Boot.dev's RPG platform is perfect. You level up and gain XP all while writing a ton of code because getting your hands on a keyboard and shipping products is really the the only way to learn. I mean, dude, according to Stack Overflow, the median salary for back-end web developers in the United States in 2023 was over $100,000. Well, I mean, that all sounds great, but I still don't know what I'm doing. That's okay. If you ever get stuck, there is a bear wizard named Boots that will help you with your lessons instead of just like giving you the answers. Plus, Boot.dev's Discord community is very active, and I know you're going to love this, they know that not everyone can necessarily afford a membership. So, you can actually read and watch the lessons for free in guest mode, but apparently paid membership unlocks the game and the interactivity. Plus, they offer a 30-day money-back guarantee. So, click our link in the description and use our code to get 25% off your first payment for Boot.dev. That's 25% off your first month or your first year, depending on the subscription that you choose. Now, back to what I was saying. The way they represented bending on screen looked great, especially air bending, which is the least cinematic of the four forms. So, overall, I loved the first episode. Loved how they faithfully adapted the look and design of the animated show, but while still found a way to keep it grounded in live action. But, you start to notice a few changes in that first episode. Sokka is less of a goofball. They gave him more pathos in the series, and overall, like, this is where I started to notice that the show lacked a lot of the character depth of the original. Like in episode 2, Kiyoshi Island. Originally, this was Sokka's personal journey to overcome. He was very sexist. There's no way a bunch of girls took us down. And over the series, Sokka gradually matures and becomes a leader. But here, he seems to already be like a mature young man. Instead, in the last couple episodes, they focused on him wanting his dad's approval, but that didn't land for me. 
I mean, we're intercutting between him and Zuko's story, and Zuko's dad literally burned the flesh from his face because he was so disappointed in him. It was hard to feel bad for Sokka by comparison. However, the casting was absolutely perfect. Ian Owsley looked exactly like Sokka from the series, and he did a great job in the role. Everybody does across the board, especially Paul Sung Hyung Lee as Uncle Iroh. Lee is a veteran of big franchises. He's popped up in the Disney Plus Star Wars shows for years, and he perfectly embodies like the sadness and the cheerfulness of Iroh. In fact, my favorite favorite moment from this season was that wagon train episode where he remembers his son and we hear this music. Now that is the melody of the soldier boy lullaby he sings at his son's shrine in Tales of Ba Sing Se. Leaves from the vine falling so slow. Absolutely wrecks me every single time. So there are places where this show has this absolute loyalty to the world building of Avatar. And I appreciated almost all of the changes. Introducing Zuko's sister Azula earlier in the series sets her up as an overarching antagonist. Danny Pudi was great as the mechanist. And here's where we get a pretty common change in this series. They combine the Omashu story with the Northern Air Temple story, which involved the mechanist. And I'm fine with changes like this. The creators want to tell as much of this story as they can, but the budget is tighter in a live action setting. Like, okay, here's something I'm sure is going to be controversial that I'll we'll talk about with the team later on. When they took the Cave of the Two Lovers story and they placed Sokka and Katara in the tunnels instead of Katara and Aang. Now, we just did a video about how the romantic resolution between Katara and Aang was a little creepy and, in our opinion, not the right ship for the series. And it's kind of telling because in this show, because of the age difference, they don't even mention Aang's crush on Katara. Now, I did like how they used that tunnel change to explore Katara and Sokka's sibling relationship. And you don't get to just ignore me. I can if you're being an idiot. Dad put me in charge. You're not dad but it did come at the expense of Aang's feelings and character development. And I think that's where the live action adaptation actually fails in its portrayal of Aang. Now, I think the actor, Gordon Comier, is great in this role, but to save money, the show feels like it has to speed run through the events of season one. The problem with that is they're speed running through all of the character growth and all of the fun times, all the little moments that made this group become a family. We don't get to see Aang just goof off and be a kid. I mean, we're told that he has friends, but we don't ever get to see these bonds develop. The show is like all meat, no fixins, no dessert. Instead of showing us Aang's childlike nature, we just get this dark, brooding pathos. And I mean, that's there, but it's just not what the show is. So Bevan, the thing is, the show does seem to make changes and skip stories that are going to alienate OG fans like you, while it also leaves out the charm and the characters which would attract new viewers. So who, who was this show for? Ah, see, I have an answer to this. The show is for consumers that hold on to this narrative that live action is a higher form of medium than animation and therefore acceptable for adult consumption. And we know this to be true because the showrunner Albert Kim said, is quoted actually, I think in the Entertainment Weekly article of saying that he wants to court Game of Thrones audiences, which is ironic because they gave us a script that spoon feeds a plot point and character motivations like the audience are children, which is something the animation doesn't do. What do you guys think? <laughs> Randolph, why don't you go first? Sorry. What were your thoughts on the show overall? Oh, by the way, everybody, we are joined here by Bevan, frequent contributor, Shri, who does our merch and our social media, and Randolph Nebrado, our lead editor. All massive Avatar fans. I, I, I love Avatar, casual fan. These guys have seen it through several times. Randolph, go ahead. As, you know, an OG Avatar fan, it's really hard not to compare the original show with this one. Um, so I would always, I would keep finding myself comparing the original show uh with the live action and finding myself not having a great time because I was like, why aren't they, why aren't they doing this? Why aren't they doing this? Oh, they're doing this differently. Um, but yeah, but you, more... you can't get hung up on that though. When you watch a show, you can't constantly think, well, I, I could be watching the anime and uh, the animation right now, you know? So apart from right. that, like, oh, I'm comparing it. How did it land for you? Like Bevan said, the dialogue just made it seem like the show didn't trust the audience. Like everything that we needed to know was mm -hmm. told to us every five minutes. He may seem like just a boy, but he's much more. He is the last airbender. And I hate, personally, I hate when a movie or show does that because it removes all of the subtext that we need to, or all the subtext that we, uh, as the audience, it can look for and, and find the motivations for the characters for. And I think it was just, as, as a show in, by itself without the, the support of the original fans uh, watching it, I don't think it holds up. Yeah, and one thing I did talk about earlier is how the whole show felt like a speed run where we got like, you know, certain points were condensed and combined, which I think we can all agree 
is okay in, mm -hmm. in an adaptation, for an adaptation yeah. to do that. Maybe you didn't like it here, but it's okay. Uh, but we did skip over, you know, it, it was like getting a microwave meal as opposed to like a nice home cooked dinner, you know, like it was fast versus substance. Shri, what do you think? You, you, I mean, I, how many times have you seen Avatar all the way through? <laughs> I am not overstating this when I say at least 40 times. Okay, so you're an OG fan. What did you think of this show and, and specifically about the points that Randolph is addressing? The dialogue just felt too clunky. I think I was saying this earlier to a couple of friends where it felt like a seventh grade persuasive essay that I was assigned to write based off the show where there was this one scene where it was like, oh, that's not me. I like to eat banana cakes and goof off with my friends. I like to play air ball and eat banana cakes and goof off with my friends. And I'm like watching this and saying like, I, I think I wrote that in like a why is this character very joyful and childish, but it's not something a person who is joyful and childish would say out loud. And I think the dialogue is very, I'm going to tell you this. And I think it's the same thing that happened with the uh, like other adaptations, like let's say the Percy Jackson show. It's very tell, not show, right? Um, yeah, especially when it comes to it dialogue. Points. At points, I think it does show, but I'll talk about that in a second. At points, yeah. it does show a lot, but I think it does run that live action adaptation of like, we know what you guys are expecting, so we're trying to check off a list. And I think, you know, it was very rushed. And that is why a lot of the dialogue was kind of shoehorned in of like, this is what we're trying to do. So technically we checked it off. The length of the show of this season, because each episode, it's only eight episodes, but each episode's 48 minutes, is basically the same length or just a little bit longer than the show itself. So when you talk about condensing and combining different things like the Northern Air Temple and Omashu and things like that, Bevan, where do you think that they went wrong in the, that adaptation? Like, do you think they did a good job of combining certain stories and certain character beats from other seasons, like I, Uncle Iroh, for instance? Yeah, I, I think where the show is at its strongest is when it's expanding the narrative and not condensing the narrative. An example of that is the add-on scenes with Zuko and Iroh at the Fire Nation, you know, especially the funeral scene or the scene, the one that was really touching to me, I know the funeral scene got everyone in the feels, but the one that was very touching is, when, is the scene that they shot when Zuko is about to leave and Iroh comes on the ship and he's stating that the only thing that he needs is on this boat and he's going to go with him and that's very touching so when you when you go down that route of let's expand upon what we know was in the animated series and talked off you know talked about and actually show it as opposed to you know condensing things down like the omashu episode where you have jet's timeline and the mechanics timeline and, you know, uh, Boomy's timeline where they all don't get to breathe as much as Zuko and Iroh's storyline does, which I think, you know, for Zuko and Iroh, those are the two characters that were given the most to do and had the most character I development agree. over the, the golden trio who didn't have really any character development. Shri, I wonder how much of that is because of, well, first of all, I want to know if you agree with what Bevan said, and I wonder how much of what she said is because maybe the filmmakers or the creators of the show said, well, people already know the Golden Trio and we didn't get much of these other characters toward the end. Like, you know, introducing Azula earlier and things like that. Do you think that they purposefully shifted to the Fire Nation earlier and at the expense of characters they assumed we already knew? It all goes back to who is this for? Because if, you know, people already know the Golden Trio, then why are we not sticking? Why are we changing a narrative? And if people don't know the Golden Trio, why are we taking away characteristics of them and kind of leaving them to be a giant blob? Like one thing I really felt bad about is that, you know, I understand, let's say we, for argument's sake, you know, it was okay to take away Sokka's misogynistic um, character arc, or not that he became misogynistic, but like, you know, he learned, um, you know, how to be more inclusive and open-minded, but that was also a big point for Katara, right? A lot of what Katara's character was, was being the mother hen of the group and being very, you know, I have to prove myself because I wasn't allowed to expand on this when I was, I wasn't allowed to expand on my waterbending and 
my own power in my hometown, right? And when you take that away, you kind of leave Katara to do nothing, or you kind of leave her to be a very okay. This is what the plot. This is who the plot happens to, and she is kind of a very reactive. Person instead of a, I have a character standpoint and I have a personality to do, and I think it's not nothing to do with the actors. I think the actors are really good with what they're given,、mm-hmm. yeah. but I do think once you take away specific plot lines, what do you have left for one of your main characters? You know, the the water bending scroll、uh, episode was really important to showcase that Katara has character flaws because、yeah. she. Was insecure about the fact that Ang could pick up water bending really quickly, which is odd that Ang doesn't do any water bending in this series. Not at all. Not at all. Not at all. Yeah, not not even a little、yeah. bit. Not even at all. I think the、all. next season will begin with him being like, "Well, I'm good at water bending now." Yeah,、so、you're good at water bending. Yeah. Montage. Yeah, I had thought about that. Yeah. But but it's just it's so sad because when you don't show that Katara also has some flaws in her own character because she's feeling insecure about the fact that she's not as good at picking up things as Ang, and then she like. Yells at him, and then she ends up stealing the water scroll in the animated series. You know, there's a teachable lesson there. Of even she is can be at fault, and she can, you know, and her brother can teach her something as well. And that also is an episode where they get to showcase how Sokka is insecure about the fact that he's the only bender, and all he seems to be good for is cleaning Appa's paws. And <laughs> it was kind of sad to lose those little moments in the live action of them not interact them. Not engaging with each other and showing each other their sides that can be flawed. Yeah, Sokka yeah. in the show, in the original show, fills, fulfills more of a kind of a wise fool role. You know, he's、yeah. the comic relief,、mm-hmm. and, and here he's maybe older, more mature, more of like the older brother character. Randolph, as far as like servicing these characters, right, where they are. I know in particular,、um, you know, you could talk about Sokka, but I'm also curious where you think about Ang in this, right? Because、mm-hmm. Ang, I, I really feel like we. I thought he was done the the worst disservice as far as showing who he is. We're being told who he is, but not shown who he is. How do you think the、oh, show、totally. fell short in that respect? I I totally agree. Yeah, there.、Um, Ang in the original, you know, I hate to keep comparing it to the original, but he was such a goof. Yeah, it, it's such a goofball. He's such a goofball in the original that、um, you're kind of like rooting for him for a bit because you see him. In the in the original, he wants to go see like he wants to go sightseeing right after he gets out of the the iceberg, and he wants to go on vacation.、Um, but in in the live action, he's kind of just like thrown into this war, and he doesn't have re- he doesn't have any time to、uh, explore his character aside from that one monologue with Appa.、Um, and it, that's where I think you know they did him a real big disservice because what was so compelling about the show is that it keep the The heart of the show are these characters, right? And so when we don't have the characters to relate to, to be invested in,、um, it 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 really hinders the the, the plot、um, of the show because you have this large narrative of of a war, right? Genocide, big themes about、um, bigotry and sexism and stuff. But at its core, it's these kids who just want to be kids at the end of the day, especially Ang, because he's he's twelve, right?、Um, and so when we have When you basically get rid of the the、um, that part of it, where they're not really、uh, they're not really kids, and they're kind of just like war, like they're how do I say this? They're they're just part of the the part of the war all of a sudden, and yeah, they're the like main, already casualties of war. Yeah, yeah, they're already casualties of war, and you have this really serious tone of war. There's it gets really. I wrote in my notes. The show's a bummer, like for the most part. <laughs> it really is. And, and、yeah. one thing that I liked about this, and I know this is controversial, I liked that setup episode where we see the fire temple and everything being destroyed. I thought all of that worked great, but I thought what the show needed was what you're talking about, which is that counterbalance, the light. You know, your Ang is more of a goofball in the first thirty seconds of every Avatar episode, and when they, you know, show him. Air bending into the statue and falling, you know. Like I think we、right. needed that. We needed them to just be children for a while.、Mm-hmm. So, like, what did you guys think of that first episode? I know it's pretty controversial among fans to start off with a bunch of airbenders getting Anakin. Um, the first episode, um, 
I had mixed feelings about it. I really liked the opening sequence where, again, if you're going to advertise that you're going to be Game of Thrones and you're opening it up with some really great earthbending, really great firebending, mm-hmm. and then you see the Fire Lord burn the earthbender from the inside out and just cook him like fried chicken. Cool. Um, but then you get to all these scenes that are just expository to, like, a very immature mm-hmm. level. And, a lo- like, especially, ah oh, man, when Grand Grand started saying... The animated intro when we just got the animated. I, uh, I, I like that though. I thought that was a nice little touch because they, they wouldn't do the intro at every episode because the intro is meant to, for anyone to pick it up. But if you're watching on Netflix, you're automatically going to be watching the next episode, right? Like no one's going to be, no one's going to need that every time. And I didn't need it rep- replicated for live action personally. Yeah, it was, but we just got the intro like five minutes ago and then she's redoing the anime and it's a different intro. They, they expanded the intro. And then you have Grand Grand saying the animated intro, and it just felt like it came out of nowhere. And the way she delivered it, I almost was like, guys, we need to do another take of that. If we're really going to do this, let's do another take of that. Long ago, the four nations lived together in harmony. Then everything changed when the Fire Nation attacked. But for the most part, I I would say that for the first episode... I don't mind them showing the genocide of the Air Nomads. I kind of would have just preferred it, though, if we saw it when he went to the Air Temple and he was going through the trauma of seeing Gyatso's burnt, you know, skeleton. I think that would have been much more impactful to for the audience and for and emotional for Aang if, like, it was kind of flashes of in between of, like, he's walking through... I, I'm trying to find a comparable, but he's walking just through the air, Southern Air Temple and there's just flashes of this genocide happening. I think that would have worked better for me. Shri, how do you think the show handled the interpretations of past avatars? When Aang is talking to Kyoshi, she's nothing like what... I. And when I compare this to the original show, there's a point because the avatars are supposed to be this this spirit of wise understanding you have lived through many lives you see it's supposed to be like the adaptation of like the dalai lama right in tibetan culture and the spirit of reincarnation you see many lives you see you see all the lives before you is in one person so when kiyoshi starts screaming at ang you know this is your fault this is everything why is it so like aggressive and intense and when people say oh kiyoshi is aggressive and intense she's the one who's like murder is right and there's a point to that but she's also she is blunt and objective and she says i did kill in season two she's like i did kill chin the conqueror i thought it was necessary and it was the best way to prove save my people Okay, but when you're taking this to a further point of just screaming at a child, it kind of takes away the um, gravitas and the, you know, understanding that, no, she knows what she's talking about instead of just having this woman yelling at a kid. Like, I don't know. I liked how they used the avatars to show conflicting points of view and personalities. Instead of Aang just getting instructions, he gets all these conflicting ideas and has to decide for himself because these were like such forceful personalities. I think that's a case of us seeing the original show and knowing what we lost from, but instead of judging this show on its own merits. Shri, are there any other problems with the adaptation of the material that you want to talk about? With, with the amount of stuff they've been changing in season one, you really don't think that they are confident that they're going to make a season two or season three because not only are you changing some of the lore or characteristics of really important characters uh, in the first season, you need to, it's okay if they do that, but they need to be able to adequately and efficiently keep up that new lore in this in season two and season three, especially the changes they made to Roku, to Boomi, people that are actually very important. Literally, the great war is because of beef with Sozin and Roku. So if you change how Roku is, if you change how Boomi is, I'm kind of terrified for the finale that they're planning to do. 
Well, speaking I, of Game of Thrones, that was the problem that Game of Thrones had, was changing too many things early on that were originally intended to be something else you know, later in the series. I don't know if the show is going to be approved for season two. It probably will, just because of how much uh, how much attention it's getting on the platform for Netflix. Um, but for season two, I hope they bring back the, uh, the original writers uh, that worked on the show before they left. Um, because I think... I don't know if you saw it, but there was a they, the reason they left was because of creative differences with the showrunner, and I feel like you can kind of see that in this show. Um, and I, I Wait, the original writer, like the writers of the original show, left this show. The, the original did. creators, yes, and they even have a writing credit uh, for Masks uh, episode six, which was actually my favorite. Which was the best episode, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I hope they bring back the. Uh, the the creators for season two um that because there is a lot of promise in this show the fight choreography was amazing cgi was probably the best bending cgi we've seen um in live action like you know, not not a big not a high standard but um yeah it's just i don't know if you guys knew this but they they uh brought on shang, shang chi martial arts consultant um alan tang i think his name was um, for uh, for this show to kind of uh, work the actors and the stunts to uh, to uh, to get them uh, you know that's why it was so good basically that's what I'm trying to say um, but yeah there the show has a lot of promise I think it can learn a lot from from this season Finally, Bevan, I want to return to the question of who was this for? I mean, why make the show like this? Yeah, I mean, to go back to my original point, it is like there's this narrative in Western culture that if it's animation, it's somehow a lesser form of art for consumption, especially for adults. And I really want us to get past that because, okay, say the showrunner does actually believe that, you know, we've got to make this more mature because we need adults to watch this too then I would encourage them to just go further in, into that. If you're really going to, because right now the animation and the scripts of the animation is more mature and more nuanced, and they are fearless in showcasing all of their characters having really high moments, really low moments, learning from those low moments, and it's a teachable lesson for everyone involved and in dealing with a lot of different themes like genocide and colonialism and racism and bigotry and all that stuff. So my, so while I can separate that animation, I'm sorry, the animated show, I, I, I would really just encourage them to, if you're going to get a season two, then, and if you're going to believe this stupid narrative that, you know, live action is more mature then actually make it more mature, actually do, do better nuanced writing. Don't spoon feed us dialogue. There was so much expository dialogue. There was no mystery. There was no wondering what a character's intentions were because they just flat out told you. And that's honestly my biggest critique of the live action show. Cause I do agree with Randolph that there is a lot of promise. There's really good, there's a really good cast. There's really good, great cast, great bending, great fight scenes. And it's almost like they only wanted to mature the fight scenes, but not the character dynamics themselves. And that would be my note for them. Well, guys, that's all the time we have. Thanks very much to our guests. You can find everybody's social links below, but we want to hear from you guys. I mean, did you like this adaptation? Do you think there were things they left out they should have kept in, things that shouldn't have been combined? Let us know your thoughts down in the comments below or at me on Twitter. And if it's your first time here, please subscribe and smash that bell for alerts. For Screen Crush, I'm Ryan Airy.